Jack Tracy Sable tonight on EWTN News Nightly. All shook up. A rare earthquake hits the Northeast United States. We have the latest. Israeli investigation. New developments in the airstrike that killed six aid workers and a driver in Gaza. The dark age. Learn more about Monday's total solar eclipse with a help from the Vatican Observatory. And music to his ears. A composer tells us about his new piece dedicated to a work by a famous Catholic poet. These stories and more tonight. From EWTN, the Global Catholic Network, this is EWTN News Nightly. Thank you for being with us. Our top story tonight, a rare East Coast earthquake. The 4.8 earthquake caught millions by surprise. Thankfully, there was no major damage. It did, however, manage to snarl traffic on the roads and rails as well as disrupt flights. The United States Geological Survey reports that it was centered near White House Station, New Jersey. There are reports that people from Pennsylvania to Boston felt the tremors. It even jolted buildings in New York City. The mayor urged everyone to remain calm. We you always concerned about aftershocks after an earthquake. But New Yorkers should go about their normal day. At this point, we do, do not have any reports of major impacts to our infrastructure or injuries. But of course, we're still assessing the situation and we'll continue to update the public. EWTN's manager of digital assets, Elisa Murphy, even experienced this quake firsthand, and she joins us now. Elisa, wow, what a way to start your Friday. Uh, tell us, where were you when this earthquake hit, and what was happening? What were you doing? You know, it was just a normal morning, Friday, uh, gearing up for the weekend, uh, looking at some register content. It was about maybe just before 1030. All of a sudden, I, I feel this rattling and this shaking, and I, I kid you not, Tracy, for a second, I would have thought, a bulldozer or a train was coming through our driveway. Uh, I couldn't really tell if it was coming from above us or below us. Uh, I'm originally from the Bay Area, so I'm I'm used to uh, earthquakes to some degree, but I didn't know this area was prone to them at all. So the last thing we thought about was doing was running out of our house. We were actually roaming around trying to investigate where this strange rattling and shaking was coming from. Uh, I have a four-year-old daughter who was home today. Uh, really startled her. Um, so it was just a really scary situation. I didn't know um, where it was coming from. You know, we have here um, oil tanks that heat our house. So it was really something so loud and so um, abrupt that I didn't know if something had um, erupted in our basement. Uh, the last thing we thought about doing was running out of the house. And so my husband was frantically running downstairs, looking around to investigate Fortunately, we don't see any damage, uh, but I'm shocked that there's no damage because it was really that that of a quaking experience. It was just uh, a bit a bit traumatic. Uh, my daughter seems okay, and from what I've heard from neighbors around the area, uh, no one was damaged. I mean, no one was injured, thankfully, but it was a really, really uh, scary morning here in the Northeast, that's for sure. Oh, absolutely. Well, Elisa, thank you so much for talking to us. We really appreciate it. And um, I hope that you don't feel any more aftershocks. Yeah, you know, we felt one maybe um, an hour and a half after the first um, earthquake, uh, but there hasn't been anything since. So hopefully all as well as we go into the weekend here. Absolutely. We'll be praying for you guys. Thank you so much. God bless, Elisa. Thank you. God bless. All right, now to the Middle East, where pressure on Israel is mounting. This amid the fallout after seven aid workers were killed in an Israeli airstrike. The Israeli military dismissed two officers and reprimanded three others, saying they mishandled critical information and violated rules of engagement. Israel added they would take steps to increase the flow of humanitarian aid into Gaza. Meanwhile, the leader of Hezbollah says that Iran's response to the Israeli attack on their consulate is inevitable. 
And I want to bring in retired U.S. Marine Corps aviator and author of the book Ghosts of Baghdad, Colonel Eric Buer. Colonel, thank you so much for coming on. It's good to be with you again. Um, I want to talk about that mistaken strike on the aid workers. Uh, Israel's top general says that initial probe indicated the aid vehicles were misidentified in the darkness of night. So what do you make of the results of Israel's investigation uh, into the killing of the World Central Kitchen aid workers? Yeah, it's tragic, absolutely tragic. Uh, nighttime operations are very difficult, uh, particularly um, when it comes to targeting. So it, it's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm impressed how quickly the Israelis moved to uh, investigate that and take action. You know, they're under a lot of pressure to do that. Uh, but it just still remains such a volatile area, certainly for the aid workers, and that was a tragic loss. But, but certainly for the Israelis attempting to defend themselves and, and continue their fight against Hamas. Yeah, um, the World Central Kitchen, um, they said they had coordinated their movements with the IDF, yet the investigation found the information it wasn't properly passed on from command to field levels. Um, what more do you know about that? I mean, is that plausible? It is. You know, it's the fog of war. It's very difficult, especially when you're looking at time-sensitive targets. Probably the Israelis are. They're looking at often that, the, uh, that Hamas is moving supplies and equipment and weapons at night. And so it puts a lot of pressure on them. Uh, to keep the pressure on the Hamas leadership and the Hamas fighters. So it happens. Uh, it's tragic. Um, I don't think it's anything systemic we've seen so far from the Israelis. They're very careful and they're very transparent about their targeting processes. And when they make a mistake, uh, they've, they've admitted it. Yeah, and sadly, mistakes and civilian deaths, they do happen during war. We know that. But this mistaken strike uh, on the aid workers' vehicle is, is really significant. What type of pressure do you think this puts on Israel now? I don't think it should put any additional pressure on Israel. They have enough pressure on themselves uh, defending a war for essentially their existence on multiple fronts. So I know the president has att attempted to influence uh, Benjamin Netanyahu with this phone call that, uh, that recently happened. Um, you know, I think uh, from a U.S. perspective, we need to maintain strong negotiating skills with the Israelis. They're a key ally in the region, a critical ally. We certainly can't be perceived as being harder on them uh, when we're uh, oftentimes reluctant to take strong measures against the Russians, and in this case, the Iranians, who are supporting Hamas and Hezbollah and the Houthis. So we need to be very careful about how that's sold uh, internationally. Uh, we have to be a great uh, ally. We have to be able to build alliances. It's a cornerstone of our foreign policy. All right, we're going to leave it right there. Colonel Bureau, always great to be with you. Thank you so much for your insights, sir. Thank you. Our President Joe Biden flew to the port of Baltimore today. There he got an up-close look at what was once the Francis Scott Key Bridge. The huge structure collapsed last week after being struck by a cargo ship that lost power. The president today getting a look at cleanup and rebuilding efforts and meeting with family members of those who died. White House correspondent Owen Jensen reports. Owen. That's right, Tracy. There were eight workers on the bridge that night, all of them immigrants from Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, or El Salvador. They were filling potholes on that span. Six of them died, two survived. Today, President Biden honored their memory. He also spoke about the path to rebuilding and reopening, saying, we're coming back soon. President Joe Biden sees for himself the damage done. The Francis Scott Key Bridge came crashing down in mere moments last month after being struck by the cargo ship Dolly, which lost power. And now, efforts underway to clear away the massive mangled mess. I'm here to say your nation has your back, and I mean it. Your nation has your back. Very soon, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers expects to open a limited access channel and is aiming to reopen a permanent navigation channel late next month. Baltimore's port handles more cars and farm equipment than any other port in the country. The colossal collapse resulting in logistical problems up and down the East Coast. Simply put, the impact here has a significant impact everywhere, up and down the coast and around the country. The president today also meeting with the Coast Guard, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and Maryland's governor. That state's maritime industry taking a blow. And federal and state authorities working to ease the economic impact on businesses and residents. And this morning, 
I signed an executive order to provide $60 million in financial relief for workers and businesses that have been impacted by the key bridge collapse. As for the remains of the victims still in the water, divers are hoping to recover the bodies, but weather conditions and the river's murky water making that difficult. Their deaths also raising questions over safety requirements and regulations. Even if the workers had been warned that the giant ship was about to hit the bridge, it's not clear if they would have had enough time to scramble to safety before it all fell to pieces in the river below. To all the families and loved ones who are grieving, I've come here to grieve with you. We all are. Now, President Biden also said today he's focused on the workers and businesses around that port that depend on that port for their incomes, adding a 20,000 jobs rely on the port. He called on companies in the area to commit to staying in Baltimore. And he emphasized union labor and American steel will help rebuild the Francis Scott Key Bridge. At the White House, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. Okay, thank you, Owen. Well, the jobs report released today shows a strong burst of hiring in the U.S. economy. The report says 303,000 workers were added to payrolls last month. That is well above the forecast of 200,000 jobs. The good news led to an initial bump on Wall Street. Well, the NCAA Women's Basketball Final Four kicks off tonight. Amid the fanfare, conservative lawmakers fear that plans from the Biden administration could cripple women's sports. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales has the latest. Eric? Good evening, Tracy. The issue here is biological men playing in women's sports, and the stakes are high. Title IX became law more than 50 years ago and equalized the playing field for women, including millions in scholarships and better facilities. Senator Tommy Tuberville, a former college football coach, tells me those gains are now in jeopardy. A lot of the same people that were activists for Title IX are against it, you know, because they want boys and and men to play against women. It, 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 you can't make it up what, what we're talking about. Now they're going to have boxing, men boxing against women in the Olympics. Senator Tuberville recently held a forum with parents, athletes, and coaches to hear their firsthand accounts. The mother of a female swimmer said her daughter's mental health suffered by having a biological male join the team. My daughter shared with me that she would be so upset and so nervous that she would become so physically ill, so anxious that she would throw up so violently that then would come out her mouth and her nose and hit the back of the bathroom wall. And she would just fall to the floor. I'm a good person. I'm a good person. And a former University of Pennsylvania swimmer recalled she and her teammates were forced to undress in the same locker room as their transgender teammate, Leah Thomas. And when we tried to voice our concerns to the athletic department, we were told Leah swimming on our team and being in our locker room was a non-negotiable. And we were offered psychological services as an attempt to re-educate us to become comfortable with the idea of undressing in front of a man. But during a recent hearing, Congresswoman Summer Lee accused Republicans of not being inclusive and spreading transphobia. You all are working so hard at excluding and demonizing a bunch of kids. I think it's important that we raise the voices of transgender athletes, their families, and teammates. Some lawmakers say transgender athletes should compete amongst themselves. And we don't want to deny trans people the right to compete. Compete in your own category. Late last month, the Senate voted down Senator Tuberville's bill that would have protected female athletes. All 51 Democrats voted to block it from proceeding. The Biden administration says it will likely try to implement new rules about transgender athletes after the 2024 election. At the Capitol, Eric Rosales, EWTN News Nightly. And we have a lot more still to come here on EWTN News Nightly, including Hello Darkness, my old friend. It has been a few years since the last solar eclipse, and we didn't want the details of Monday's event to be overshadowed. We have a preview.
Welcome back. Preparations are underway for Monday's total solar eclipse in New York. The baseball game between the Yankees and Miami Marlins has been pushed back four hours over concerns of in-game delays from the darkness. Also in New York, six prison inmates will be allowed to watch the eclipse after filing a lawsuit. The state originally planned to lock down its prisons during the celestial event. The total solar eclipse means the sun will be completely covered by the moon. The next time this will be viewable by most of the United States will not be until the year 2044. We recently spoke with the Vatican Observatory for a preview of Monday's historic event. For more, we go to Chris Graney, adjunct scholar at the Vatican Observatory. Chris, thanks so much for being with us. Uh, I know one of your colleagues at the Vatican Observatory says that a total solar eclipse is, quote, one of the most breathtaking sights all of nature has to offer. Tell us more about this and how often does this occur? I mean, would you consider this a rare event? Oh yeah, that's this is only the second one that I've ever seen. Um, then the first one was only in 2017, and that's because uh, it decades went by before between you know the last uh, solar e total solar eclipse to pass across the United States and the one in 2017. Now we've gone from 2017 to 2024, and we had two that are close together. So yeah, they're they're a, a rare occurrence, and it is worth your while if you have the means and the ability to travel to the path of totality where the sun is completely blocked to go do it. Um, don't be settled. Don't settle for 99%. That's like having all the lottery ticket numbers except one. You want to get it all. Yeah. And Chris, where would that be? Where is the best place to see this eclipse? So there's a you want to look online for eclipse maps because the this, the path of the eclipse starts it, it crosses um, from the Pacific Ocean through Mexico up through Texas sweeps up through Arkansas it cuts up through Indiana and Ohio and then out through Maine so it's the, and uh, it's about a 40 mile or so wide path and you know so anywhere along that line but you have to be within that that swath across the U.S. You mentioned the one back in 2017. I was lucky enough to see that. How different is this one from that one? This one is longer. So um, the geometry of the sun and the earth and the moon makes for the, the, the shadow path to be a little fatter. So you, you'll, get a, you'll get a longer total eclipse experience this time. What about the church, Chris? What role has the Catholic Church and even the Vatican Observatory played in the study of solar eclipses? So one of the things that's going to happen with the solar eclipse is that as the moon blocks out the, the disk of the sun, you can see the atmosphere of the sun, the corona, that's much larger than the disk. And uh, one of the first people to do really thorough studies of that using spectroscopy, where you pass the light, from, light through a, spectr uh, uh, a prism and break it up into its components to see what materials are present in glowing objects, was Father Angelo Secchi, a Jesuit astronomer in Italy. Um, he actually had a, a telescope on the roof of St. Ignatius uh, Church in Rome, uh, not just a telescope, a whole observatory. Um, the foundations of that are still are still visible. You can actually see them on uh, Google Maps of, of St. Ignatius. You can see the circular cuts that where these things were built on the roof of the church. Yeah, we are looking forward to it. Chris, thank you so much for coming on and speaking to us about all this. We appreciate it. God bless. All right. Thanks for having me. Up next on EWTN News Nightly, Jubilee Year. The Vatican releases more information about its special initiative for 2025. We have a report from Rome. Plus, a composer tells us about his new work inspired by the Hound of Heaven. releasing more information about the Jubilee year in 2025. EWTN Vatican Bureau Chief Andreas Tannhauser has more. The Jubilee has always been an event of great spiritual, ecclesial and social significance in the life of the Church. While the opening of the 2025 Jubilee year is months away, the planning is well underway. The Vatican has just revealed its long list of initiatives for the special occasion. The goal is to provide an experience of faith, foster dialogue and share the importance of culture with the faithful. The Holy Father tapped the Dicastery for Evangelization to prepare the program. 
It includes the In Camino project, which is a pilgrimage to Europe's historic abbeys. It symbolizes a journey of faith, reason and environmental stewardship. Monsignor Dario Eduardo Vigano is the vice-chancellor of the Pontificum Academies of Sciences and Social Sciences. And he explained to EWTN News the cultural outreach includes art exhibitions, concerts and movies. The opening movie is called The Gates to Heaven, directed by De Sica and Zavattini, a film shot in 1944 and released in 1945. It is basically a film that no one has ever seen. It is an account of a pilgrimage to Loreto and is filmed in the Basilica of St. Paul outside the walls. There is involvement from the Catholic world, but also from the top leadership of the Secretariat of State. We remember that the future Paul VI, who worked in the Secretariat of State, was on the set in St. Pull outside the walls with the crew and directors. It is a good movie that is worth seeing. Archbishop Reno Fisichella emphasized how the Jubilee stands as a testament to the enduring power of hope. Quoting Pope Francis, he said, May this year of grace contribute greatly to restoring a climate of hope and trust as a prelude to the renewal and rebirth that we so urgently desire. Now, within the culture, Within art, literature, music, we can express the beauty of the gospel and the beauty of our faith. When uh, speaks about uh, Jubilee is culture, uh, is an expression in order to express the beauty that uh, for centuries uh, faith produced and uh, was also able to communicate. I think that uh, the Jubilee can be another possibility uh, to culture to express the beauty of our faith. The works of two great artists of the 20th century, Salvador Dali and Marc Chagall, will be featured in the cultural program. The good news? Every event will be free admission because, as Archbishop Rino Fisichella tells us, culture is priceless. In Rome, Andres Townhauser, EWTN News Nightly. A finally tonight, Carnegie Hall in New York City is set to host the debut next week of a work based on the faith-based poem, The Hound of Heaven. As Andrew Lloyd wrote, Amaranthine, the title is taken from a line from the famous poem written in the late 1800s by Catholic writer Francis Thompson. Lloyd is a professor at the University of Utah, and his works have been performed inside of Catholic cathedrals and other churches around the world. And the composer, as Andrew Lloyd, joins us now. Andy, so great to be with you. Uh, first, congratulations uh, on the upcoming performance at Carnegie Hall. That's so exciting. Tell us, how are the final preparations going? Fantastic. I just heard from the pianist this morning, Rachel Willis Sorensen, truly one of the top sopranos in the world right now, um, and Tamar Sanikitze from University of Texas are rehearsing, and, and I've heard some of the recording. And it sounds magnificent. I can't wait to hear it live. Oh, it sounds wonderful. Now, tell us, how has you know Christianity inspired your music, and in particular, Catholicism? Yeah, uh, many years ago, I, I, listen, I've always had a strong belief in our Savior Jesus Christ. And it's always resonated with me. But many years ago, I had the occasion to sit with my professor and listen to Johann Sebastian Bach's St. Matthew's Passion. And at the end of every single score that Bach wrote, he wrote the text, Soli Deo Gloria, for the glory of God. And that really resonated with me. And soon after, I fell in love with the music of Elidia Messiaen, who's a, who's a famous French com Catholic composer. And I was always intrigued by his deep, abiding faith in Christ and how he explained that and interpreted that in his own um, music and his deep Catholicism. And I've always been in love with the music of Claudio Monteverdi, whose music, uh, whose, whose Vespers from 1614. And so I actually, even though I'm not Catholic myself, I include Gregorian chant, um, uh, Renaissance uh, motifs in my music, and, and I have a deep love for the Catholic uh, faith and for our ancestors that, that gave us such gifts of music. Through the generations. Yeah, and you do such beautiful work too. I want to take a listen to a sample of your music now. Let's take a listen.
Andy, tell us about what we just heard. So beautiful. Thank you so much, Tracy. Uh, yes, the Bells of Stoke is is um, my my great grandma, Laura Lorenzen, um, converted to to becoming a Latter Day Saint uh, earlier in her life and left a life of um, luxury and wealth in Norway to move uh, to Idaho and married a farmer. And so when I wrote this piece, I imagined my great grandma standing on her porch in Idaho and also standing at the ocean front in Norway, in, um, in Shoke, where she was born, where her father was lost at sea and looking out over the ocean, looking out over the prairie and hearing the bells of Shoke, the church bells from her church home as, as an imitation or or us, a, a symbolic of us hearing God, the bells of our Heavenly Father calling us home. Absolutely. Andy, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing all this with us. And congratulations again on the concert. God bless you. Tracy, thank you. God bless you too. And for more information on Andy and his world premiere at Carnegie Hall next week, visit sandrewlloyd.com. And we thank you for watching tonight. Remember, you can follow us on social media, Facebook, X, and Instagram at EWTN News Nightly. I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.